Okay, let's get started. So uh, welcome everybody to uh, today's webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us during your busy lunch hour and taking time to uh, join us. Today's topic is hybrid and multi-cloud with Nutanix clusters. So uh, we will be recording this webinar and uh, the video lines and the uh, audio will be muted. So however, the Q&A section will be on. So we'll, we will be monitoring the Q&A. So we encourage you to send us questions. You know, we'll be throughout the webinar as they come up. So um, our agenda today, will introduce the presenters and then we'll talk about hybrid cloud. What's the driving adoption of uh, the hybrid cloud strategies? What are the challenges of the hybrid cloud world? Then we'll go into Nutanix clusters. What is Nutanix clusters and how does it solve the hybrid cloud challenges? And then we'll go into a demo of Nutanix clusters. So today's presenters will be myself, my name is Jim Pross. I'm one of several solution architects here at Evolving Solutions. Um, I focus on the hybrid infrastructure uh, area, and I have been with Evolving Solutions for 20 plus years. And then we have a special guest with us today. We have Derek Rabel. So Derek is with Nutanix. He's a senior systems engineer, and he's also based in Minnesota. And uh, Derek, uh, We've been uh, we've had a few years together, haven't we? <laughs> Just a bit. Um, yeah, so we've we've had a few years. Yeah, by my count, uh, I think it was nine. Last I checked, I was a consultant at a firm uh, in Edina, Minnesota. Um, I was on a Microsoft contract, but quickly took over uh, NetApp responsibilities. And uh, Evolving was the reseller that uh, that deployed that, and so quickly got introduced to Jim and. Um, beyond that, the uh, just the, the helpfulness and the expertise that uh, Jim and the rest of the architects at Evolving Solutions have. So was uh, immediately impressed um, as a customer. Um, and then uh, later that year, I joined NetApp as an SE and got to know the Evolving Solutions team uh, even more um, and continue that relationship as I switched from NetApp to Nutanix, where I've been uh, at Nutanix for just over four years. So. Um, yeah, happy to be here for the content today and looking forward to the, the discussion. Yes, um, myself, and we, we, we appreciate the relationship. So let's go into today. Uh, we'll start out with some of you may not know about Evolving Solutions. So as you can see here, we're pretty excited. This is our 25th anniversary year. Uh, so we're kind of celebrating this as kind of a big milestone for Evolving Solutions. So, you know, 25 years. You have your challenges, but you also have a lot of fun. So, um, and then our next slide here, you see Evolving's hybrid cloud vision. So our vision is that Evolving is to help our clients modernize and automate their mission critical applications and infrastructure to support business transformation in a hybrid cloud world. And our operations philosophy is that cloud is not a place, next slide here. Cloud is a set of disciplines. So as you guys all are aware, cloud is kind of a weighted word, isn't it? But to evolving, cloud means that experience, that ability to be flexible, to be agile, the ability to adapt to your changing business needs and requirements. So let's dig into today's uh, webinar. So we're gonna start off with our hybrid cloud discussion. So Derek, why don't you uh, give us a brief overview of some of the benefits of the private cloud and then give us some benefits of the public cloud. Yeah, you got it, Jim. And everyone get your buzzword bingo cards out, right? Check out <laughs> hybrid cloud. We've uh, now said that a few times already. And private cloud, let's, uh, let's check that one off too. So private cloud, public cloud, and the uh, the new world of hybrid cloud for IT organizations. Um, private cloud and public clouds both have their unique benefits. And um, we'll start by talking with uh, with private cloud. And if I was to you know use one word to describe the the private cloud benefits is it's predictable. Um, another word you might use is is it's proven. 
Um, you know what it's going to do. You know how long it takes you to do things in your own on-prem environment. Um, you know what it takes to secure it and uh, and operate it. So it's it's predictable. It's proven. You know how it works. Mm-hmm. Now, as we you know get into the public cloud and its benefits, one word I would use here is the flexibility that's offered in the public cloud. Um, so some may use that as describing the rapid time to value of a public cloud deployment where you can rapidly spin up a lot of different uh, VMs or applications or services in a public cloud and arrive at a uh, a, a valuable solution sooner than it would take you to do that uh, on-prem in your private cloud. Um, Flexible in how you pay for it, right? You pay for what you use when you use it. If you turn something off, you don't pay for that asset. If you turn a server off in your data center, you still paid for having that server deployed in your uh, uh, in your data center. So there's uh, it's it's the predictable world and the flexible world that uh, that we are arriving at, you know, here in uh, in in the 2020s of how do we marry the private cloud benefits with the public cloud benefits? Um, Some uh, IT organizations have taken this on already and have uh, have learned the uh, the gotchas of trying to do a hybrid cloud with maintaining both an on-prem environment and a public cloud environment. Um, others are just starting that journey. And Nutanix here, um, late in 2020, uh, we introduced a way that we think uh, is a real market differentiator for how to enable your hybrid cloud and what does that look like, right? So in Nutanix's opinion, uh, we feel that in order to create a hybrid cloud, you need to have a single way of doing a thing across the different clouds that you're working in. Um, And that single platform gives you some of the benefits of moving applications to and from different clouds back to on-prem. A hybrid cloud should uh, integrate natively with what you're doing in in the public cloud rather than be a sidecar to what you may already be doing. Um, and then a, you know, a little icing on top is if there's one way to license all of this across the different clouds, that would make for something, uh, something truly unique. And uh, this is where we arrive at the Nutanix clusters offering that, uh, that we have introduced here. So Derek, so I was just kind of you know, summarizing here You mentioned a lot of benefits of private cloud. You mentioned a lot of benefits of the public cloud and there really are separate, right? They're like two data centers or two areas, two ecosystems, but we need both. So it seems like it's not always as easy to make that bridge or that unification that you're talking about here. It's not always as easy as as it sounds. Oh, definitely not. I mean, there's there's a reason uh, that there are Amazon AWS certification tracks. There's Azure certification tracks. There's VMware certification tracks. There's Cisco, NetApp, all these different technologies that are in their respective places. It requires a lot of knowledge to do those things, you know, the right way, the best way. And so um, it's definitely not easy. Uh, I'm sure there are those out there that uh, have certifications across all those different spectrums. Uh, but you know, I am I am not one of those uh, those folk. I, I need to stay in my uh, my swimming lane, so to speak. So um, if we can, you know, we at Nutanix can create a hybrid cloud experience that gives you a way of doing hybrid cloud that's that leverages both the on-prem and public cloud benefits. Then uh, we think there's going to be a lot of adoption of that. Cool. So I'll mention Nutanix clusters. So what is it, right? So Nutanix clusters is uh, a way to deliver the Nutanix operating experience in a public cloud environment. Uh, So for those uh, on the webinar or catching this recording, if you have Nutanix deployed on-prem, you understand that Nutanix, we're a software company. We install our software on hardware to give you a um, a, a data center OS is, is one way I like to describe it. And so with Nutanix clusters, we're bringing that software installation experience to the bare metal instances available in public clouds. Um, and so at uh, if I skip ahead to the, the next illustration, 
So we're, we're, go ahead. Can you go back. Can you go back to that slide, Derek. So what I what I like about this is it's kind of like we're all most of us in the audience are familiar with Nutanix on like an ethics platform, right? The clients or on Lenovo or on UCS or on HPE, right? They're, they're familiar with how Nutanix is software and it runs on that platform, that ecosystem. But it seems like here, like what's going on next as we go, as we dig in is that you, Nutanix has extended that platform into the cloud. So now that public cloud really becomes just like a, another platform that Nutanix software runs on. That, that is exactly correct, Jim. And that's, uh, that's the, the second bullet point here on the slide where this becomes a, just another cluster in your uh, PRISM management interface. So the, you may have you know, your, uh, your primary data center, you may have some remote office data centers that you're already using PRISM to unify the management of all those different locations in one place. A Nutanix cluster running on AWS just becomes another cluster in your existing management ecosystem. Um, and that, uh, that was the goal of Nutanix clusters is to just make it a part of what you're already doing from a Nutanix ecosystem standpoint, rather than something separate that, um, that uh, you know, I, I use the term sidecar, right? We, didn't want, we want this to integrate with what you're doing with Nutanix and integrate with what you're doing with the public clouds, uh, AWS being that first public cloud that we support. So I mentioned the, you know, the, the native integration aspect. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. So with Nutanix clusters on AWS, this is not a service that you're signing up for from Nutanix where we create a cluster and then outsource it back to you, the customer. No, this is standing up bare metal instances in your existing AWS account. And you're just giving Nutanix the permission to use our uh, cl uh, clusters portal to run the Nutanix installer on those bare metal instances. So a couple, you know, benefits of that is a, this is, this just ties into your existing AWS account, your billing system. This isn't something separate. Um, it sits in the same VPC. Um, mm -hmm. So that way you're not, you know, being forced to um, have any additional costs of traversing VPCs to get to different uh, other services that you may be running in AWS. Um, and then I already alluded to one of the, the, the third bullet point here is it integrates with your existing Prism Central. Um, and so it, uh, it, yeah, it just becomes a, another part. It's, it's another data center for your new tax footprint. It's really like an extension. It, it's, uh, in other words, you know, we'll use Jim as a bridge. It uh, yeah. it bridges what you're doing, you know, on prem to what you can, what you already may be doing in AWS, uh, but now you can uh, make Nutanix a part of your public cloud strategy. So I mentioned that AWS is the uh, first public cloud uh, provider that we are uh, GA with. Um, Azure, we are quickly approaching early access or, or beta for a select number of Nutanix customers and prospects. Um, and we expect to be GA within Azure uh, later here in 2021. Um, and conversations are underway with Google Cloud for that to be a third uh, public cloud where Nutanix clusters is, uh, is supported in. And so again, it's, it's this common bridge. Uh, I'm, I'm stealing your words, Jim. Uh, you know, it's, it's a bridge that uh, that unifies what you're doing on-prem with AWS and uh, with Azure once that is generally available later this year. So this, this is nice. This is a, I mean, if you look at this, we've now, we're not locked into a particular public cloud. Uh, we can now go to AWS, we can go to Azure, we can actually replicate, you can actually have both, right? You could have uh, some clusters in AWS, you can have some in Azure, you can replicate. So this this really opens things up. It gives that flexibility that our that our customers are demanding. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to when uh, when Azure is generally available later this uh, this this calendar year. Yeah. Uh, being able to showcase um, a cluster running in a a colo let's let's call that a part of your private cloud, um, a cluster running in AWS and a cluster running uh, running in Azure. 
and showing how quickly and easily you can replicate to and from those different public clouds as well as your private cloud at Ecolo and be able to you know, survive uh, the different outages of, that public clouds have. Uh, you know, that's something that we didn't talk about with the, you know, the benefits of, of a private cloud versus the benefits of a public cloud. Your private cloud, you know, most of you, you know, operate on a five or six nines, you know, standpoint. Public clouds, they don't guarantee that. <laughs> they don't guarantee that at one bit. Um, I think, uh, in fact, there was a, another US East uh, AWS outage uh, that happened this week. So uh, being able to have these kind of tools in your toolbox as you architect a highly available solution for your for your data centers, for your applications, um, this just becomes a very compelling thing to uh, to add to that. Use cases. So I mentioned that uh, this this becomes a, a very intriguing tool in your toolbox. Um, what does uh, what is clusters being used for? Uh, what has clusters been uh, been tested on with its lengthy early access? So there's a, a lot of uh, customer testimonials that you can already read about um, who were a part of the uh, the early access or were some of the first GA customers of uh, Nutanix clusters at uh, at our homepage. Um, we'll include links for that at the uh, the end of the presentation. Um, but uh, it's it's a it's a wide range of uh, of use cases. Um, you know, I'd say the 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 lowest hanging fruit uh, is is a, a new way to do lift and shifts migrations to the public cloud. Um, a lot of you um, on the call may have CIOs or CTOs that have a um, public first or public only mantra or a goal uh, that they want to achieve here in the next you know one, three, five years, whatever their uh, their their plans are. Um, and uh, we as IT professionals understand that not everything is a perfect fit. Not everything can be replatformed or refactored into a public cloud service. And so the only way to fully adhere to a public only mantra is to actually just run that VM that you're running on-prem as a VM in the public cloud. Uh, with Nutanix clusters, that VM can be easily migrated using a native Nutanix to Nutanix replication, or even if it's not running on Nutanix today, we have tools, um, one being Nutanix Move, that will take your existing ESXi VM, or maybe it's already a EC2 VM running in AWS. Um, it can use the tool Move to move that onto Nutanix, whether that be on-prem or in AWS, Again, because it's a Nutanix cluster. So it doesn't matter where the Nutanix cluster is running, we have a tool to help you uh, onboard your existing environment or uh, a Nutanix environment into, uh, into AWS. Yeah, I kind of see this as really being an easy button. I mean, in, a, in the past, lift and shift, again, was had its challenges. You know, uh, getting the data from your private cloud to the public cloud was usually that's pretty not as challenging, but then running your VMs, you know, do you have to convert them or with Nutanix clusters, there is no conversion. That VM that's running on your on-premises is being replicated and that configuration is in Nutanix clusters on AWS. So it, it, there is no software coding or refactoring that, that is required. It is what you are used to. You see it in Prism, you see your VMs, you spin them up. Exactly that. It's it, the the ability to onboard yourself into Nutanix clusters is easiest for a Nutanix customer with a Nutanix cluster running in your on-prem environment. Because uh, just as you say, Jim, um, especially with advances with Prism Central and our leap capability for uh, for site-to-site -site replication, you see a VM in Prism and you you tell it where you want it to run. And uh, yep. just like that, you could be, uh, I mean, internet bad bandwidth being the, the limiting factor of uh, how quickly you can uh, transfer a VM running on-prem to a, 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 a Nutanix cluster running in AWS. So you, so you kind of mentioned Leap, and that kind of, I think, goes into the next use case of business continuity is really with Nutanix clusters, making the public cloud a DR solution really becomes realistic. I mean, uh, Leap is, is a Nutanix software that will actually replicate the VMs on-prem and to another cluster, and it will sync the data and everything, and it will do orchestration too. It'll actually spin up these VMs first, spin up these VMs seconds, re-IP them and everything else. So I see a lot of 
you know, requirements for this. I'm, you know, we, we get customers asking about, you know, there are, how do we, you know, some customers, they want to downsize their, their colo uh, facilities. They want to, they want options. They want flexibility. They want, so this, I, if you want to add anything to that, but I see this is a pretty, pretty nice use case. Yeah. You already said a lot on that, but it's, uh, it's this, gets into that public cloud benefit of fractional consumption. Pay for what you use when you use it, when you need it. Um, DR or cold DR, right? We hope we never need to use it, right? It's the insurance policy that every IT organization takes out or should take out if you don't have a DR strategy to make sure that you can keep your business running in the event something bad happens, you know, where you primarily run your data center. Now, there's a lot of different ways to uh, to, to, uh, to achieve that, um, some have uh, their primary site mirrored to a secondary site, like for like all the hardware, and on a routine basis, they'll just flip the switch and now all the, all the VMs are running in their secondary data center. After a month, they switch back. Great way to prove that your DR plan is, is working because you're actually using it as a part of your day-to-day uh, -day or month-to-month -month, um, IT uh, operational practice. Correct. Uh, other customers, um, their DR strategy is call their favorite VAR of choice and order up a bunch of servers and ship them somewhere to get them stood up, right? There's a, there's a lot of lag time in uh, waiting for that gear to ship, to get stood up, to get tapes or, you know, backup drives, uh, get that data restored and get your business up and running. Now, the, the business continuity use case with new task clusters is you can... Uh, yeah, replicate a, a, a seed, you know, some kind of baseline data to, uh, to uh, AWS on a regular basis. And for the times that you're not replicating data, leave that cluster off or leave that cluster in a minimally viable state where you don't need, let's say you're running 20 clusters on or 20 nodes for your on-prem environment. You don't need to keep 20 nodes online in AWS 24 by 7 by 365. You can maintain just a three node cluster up in AWS. So that way you're constantly receiving the replication updates, but you're not, you know, uh, running a, uh, a meter of 20, right. 20 different nodes in AWS. We all know the most, sorry, Jim, go ahead. So it's you significantly reduce the cost of running in, in the public cloud. So you have your three nodes. And then if you do happen to go happen to go live or you do have a situation where you need to switch over, that's one of the benefits of the public cloud, right? Boom, I can add in, you know, 15 more nodes, expand the cluster, and now I'm running. Exactly. So I'm, paying, I'm paying for those, those additional nodes at that particular point in time. I get up and running, and then I can also reverse it. Once that situation is done, I fix my on-prem, I get everything back. I can then spin it back down. Exactly right. And the new tax clusters portal makes all that happen. So when you need to quickly expand a cluster, say that DR event happens and you need to expand that from three to 20, new tax clusters portal is the place to go. Click expand this cluster by X number of nodes. It expands that cluster and you are, uh, once that's done, you're ready to bring up your entire environment uh, in that environment. Yeah, trying to do that on on-prem is pretty difficult and time-consuming. Exactly. Again, mir mirroring the the public cloud benefits with uh, with positive business outcomes. It's uh, uh, one another one of those low-hanging uh, fruit use yeah. cases for uh, for Nutanix clusters. Then, uh, yeah, a couple of the other ones that we document here: um, the on-demand elasticity, and this kind of plays into one way to do business continuity, right? You just, you maintain something minimally viable and you on-demand expand it. Uh, in fact, you can use some of the uh, Prism Pro capabilities and Prism Central to trigger a Nutanix clusters expansion event uh, based on whatever your trigger is. Maybe it is a uh, runway event where this Nutanix cluster on-prem is gonna run out of capacity in 30 days. Let's start making sure our AWS cluster has the capacity to spin up applications. You know, the moment that we run out of the uh, the ability to do that here on prem, um, maybe it's it's seasonal elasticity, uh, or you know, in the case of what happened twenty twenty, um, you know, pandemic driven. You know, a, a shift in work paradigm. Right? 
Um, all of a sudden, companies were going work remote for 100% of their staff, and they may have only had a you know Citrix or Horizon View environment to support you know a tenth of that footprint. Uh, we have um, uh, a, a blog post um, showing how quickly uh, one of our Citrix architects was able to spin up 2,000 additional VDI seats using Nutanix clusters on AWS. Um, and nice. how quickly, uh, in two hours, he was able to uh, create his first cluster in AWS, um, do the replication from his on-prem environment to AWS, and get those 2,000 seats running. So. Um, the elasticity is something that, uh, that you know, cannot be, um, that, yeah, it, it is a, uh, a great nice. use case. <laughs> yeah. Any other use cases that you that come to your mind, Jim? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, it's very similar to what you just talked about, you know, BDI, and, you know, especially what's, what's happening. And we, we constantly see the need for, hey, we need another 2,000 uh, BDI, we need another 1,000, we need this. And, and I think that that flexibility of expanding um, and ex, you know bridging your on-prem VDI solution and, and going into the cloud and use that because it might be for only for a certain amount of time. So instead of doing all that capital expense and getting all these servers and getting everything going and having all, all this huge investment, now we can quickly get that up and running, get it going, and then make that determine. And if, oh, we only need it for a couple months or a six-month period, then we can spin it back down. Yeah. Yeah, one last use case that uh, that that I like to think of is using AWS as a sandbox before you commit to investing in something on-prem. So if mm -hmm. you have developers that have an idea, um, you can create, you know, on-demand create one of these new tax clusters, spin up the VMs to uh, vet out their uh, their sandbox idea, and if it has merit. You can then, you know, use cluster to cluster replication to, you know, save their work and uh, save whatever uh, infrastructure investment they made in getting it to work in uh, in the public cloud, and just uh, use cluster to cluster replication to get that on prem. So, yeah, it's it's a tool, and there's a lot of different ways you can use this tool for for your architecture designs. And I'm excited that uh, it's a part of our our, our toolkit now. So we mentioned a lot of uh, the use cases, um, and so now let's talk about the, the benefits of the Nutanix clusters hybrid cloud method versus uh, versus others. So I think we already you know hit on this one uh, quite a bit, Jim, in, in discussing the use cases, but the ability to you know seamlessly burst into AWS by having the Nutanix platform be that bridge from on-prem to uh, to the public cloud. So, you know, in the instance of, you know, something seasonal, something unexpected, a DR event, you know, it, it is very easy to spin up in AWS and use the, the, the common Nutanix cloud platform uh, to, to, to bridge yourself into, uh, in, into AWS for a time, for a period, and then scale back down if, if, if needed. So it's um, that easy ability to, you know, leverage Nutanix to Nutanix replication to get things from one place to another um, is definitely one of the unique factors that the Nutanix brings to this hybrid cloud model. Yeah, I think as you as you mentioned earlier, but we, you'll probably show in a demo is Nutanix is doing all the heavy lifting in, in the background as far as preparing AWS and all the networking and all all the you know bare metal instances. It's all you just go into portal, you just boom, 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 you click and boom, it builds it. Exactly that. Yep. Yeah. With uh, with that with the Nutanix clusters portal that I've mentioned. Um, you know, when you first set it up, you know, you, you're giving it a AWS account that has the permissions to run CloudFormation, which is what we're using to install our software on bare metal instances. But a part of that, um, we're creating some uh, secure default security groups. So as this gets spun up, it's not just sitting out there in your uh, Amazon ecosystem, your VPC, just waiting for everything else to, you know, log in and, and wreak havoc on it. Um, you know, we, we do some uh, default things to keep it locked down and secure. And again, all this is automation driven, not things that you as a, a, a sysadmin need to do, but it is a part of the Nutanix process. Um, end to end, uh, you can get a your first Nutanix cluster on AWS up and running in, in under an hour. Uh, and for those that are familiar with how long it takes to um, get a Nutanix cluster rack stacked and log into Prism for the first time on-prem, 
it's roughly the same time, uh, depending on how many things you're uh, you're racking and stacking, or if you you know don't include that as a part of the install time. Um, very similar time to value of first VM being deployed on a new tax cluster, whether that be on prem or in AWS. Second benefit, unified management. Again, something that uh, we've you know already you know um, talked to as a part of uh, explaining what Nutanix clusters is, but it is uh, Nutanix clusters on AWS. It ties into everything you're already doing on prem. So anything that you're doing in Prism, anything that you're doing from a Nutanix files, a Nutanix object standpoint, anything you're doing with Nutanix flow and its micro segmentation capabilities. All of that is inherited by your Nutanix cluster running in AWS. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that Nutanix flow use uh, cap capability. You don't have to redo security policies for something that you set up on-prem for something that's running in the public cloud, right? With Nutanix flow, you're telling it what IPs or what IP spaces or what, um, what category or uh, what kind of VM it is allowed to communicate with. And as those VMs move across your, uh, your private cloud or public cloud deployments, it inherits those same policies. So it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. again, just simplifying and maintaining consistency from on-prem to, to public cloud. Uh, that's, that's something, again, unique to the Nutanix deployment of uh, this hybrid cloud strategy. To me, that's a it's a that's a big benefit. You know, a lot of our customers and even myself must be in sysadmins, work with them. We're, we're stretched very thin, and uh, not having to learn. I already know my tool sets. I already know how things work. That's not changing. It's, it's not like a total rewrite. Exactly. And Nutanix Calm, the uh, application uh, automation and orchestration tool built into Prism Central, same thing, right? Mm -hmm. like a Nutanix cluster running in AWS just becomes another endpoint for Calm to automate and orchestrate against. So it's everything that you're used to with the Nutanix ecosystem, you can have that in the public cloud now. Nice. And then I think uh, these last two benefits uh, are should really open up the eyes of, uh, you know, CFOs in your organization that are getting a little bit tired of what uh, what your monthly a AWS spend may be, uh, but we have a couple ways of helping you save money in uh, in the public cloud. Uh, the first one is the ability to hibernate and resume a full cluster um, to to turn off or stop your EC2 costs and transfer that to a S3 uh, bucket where. All the memory states, all the uh, all the VM data, all the user data, all the, the the cluster configuration, all that is saved as an S3 object. Um, and we all know that uh, S3 is pennies on the gig. So even if you are talking about you know terabyte size clusters, you know it's just a few dollars to maintain that uh, that uh, cluster state in storage. And then when you're ready to bring that back online and start incurring costs from the EC2 compute side then you are able to resume that. Um, and again, this, this hibernate resume is something that can, that can be scheduled. Um, it's a, another cost saving is as you're creating a cluster, you have the ability to put a timestamp on that cluster creation. So let's say, you know, some admin forgot that I made this 16 node cluster in AWS and it's running 24 by seven. Well, at, uh, at cluster create, one of the defaults you can do is to, you know, have a, Auto uh, auto decommission date, mm -hmm. so that way you don't accidentally leave something running, you know, uh, in the in the public cloud. Where again, the most expensive thing you can do in public cloud is run something twenty four by seven by three sixty five, especially if it's not uh, not necessarily. Yeah, not used. <laughs> That's a nice feature, definitely. And then uh, this isn't really a, a a a capability of clusters, just a a reality of uh, Nutanix clusters. It kind of gets back to our comments about running something 24 by 7. Um, you, by using Nutanix clusters, you can increase your cloud efficiency, thereby reducing your cost. And what do I mean by that? Um, let's go down our memory lane, and uh, we're all uh, P to Ving our data centers. You know, in the 2000s, uh, early late 2000s, um, into early 2010s. Um, what was one of the key drivers or the key benefits that you got from virtualizing your data center 
Um, one way to describe it was it was the elimination of micro waste. Uh, and I define micro waste as unused utilization in a fully paid asset. So back in the physical world, you had a use case, whether that be an application, a database, whatever, you buy a server to run that app. Now that app may or more likely not did not use 100% of that CPU and did not use 100% of that memory. So you paid for this rack mount server or blade server, and you're not using every single bit of that. Now multiply that by hundreds or thousands of physical servers you had in your data center, and you had all this waste that once you actually got into fully virtualizing your data center, A, you bought less hardware, yes, because you were buying you know, hardware that was more dense and could uh, uh, run more VMs on it, but that's what was driving the second part was you were eliminating that micro waste. So you actually paid less in hardware because you didn't need, you, you're able to re reclaim some of the savings of you don't need that many cores in your data center. You don't need that much memory in your data center when you're using things more efficiently. Fast forward here to today, EC2 instances in AWS. Uh, I think at last count, there's well over a hundred different kinds of EC2 sizes. Um, so there, there is potential that every single use case has a very specific EC2 size to uh, to fit it with. But that's a lot of uh, uh, man hour investigation to figure out ahead of time what is the right size for this this one VM that I'm doing things with. So odds are you're going to standardize across a instance or a handful of instances. And you're going to have similar kinds of microwaste problems. With an EC2 instance, you're paying for all of that vCPU and all of that virtual memory. Now, if that VM isn't using every single bit of that vCPU that you're paying for, mm -hmm. or every bit of that memory that you're paying for, you're wasting money. So what does that mean with Nutanix clusters? That same concept of P to Ving your on-prem data centers from physical servers to VMs running on a virtualization platform, you can take that same, you can draw a parallel to, I'm paying for this whole EC2 instance, but what if I, you know, we're able to co-run this VM next to other VMs on a virtual platform. That's what Nutanix clusters is. And so uh, final comment on this, right? Um, depending on how much vCPU oversubscription your, your IT organizations run at, that's how much more money and uh, how much more efficient you can run in AWS. So uh, for anyone listening to this that is uh, that has a lot of EC2 spend as a part of their monthly AWS billing, take a look at Nutanix clusters. Um, we've done a pretty extensive uh, TCO analysis of Nutanix clusters running in AWS versus running EC2 native in a uh, AWS versus running uh, VMs in Azure. And uh, it's a very intriguing finding. So get a hold of uh, your evolving SC or evolving rep or your Nutanix rep or your Nutanix SC so you can get a hold of that report um, because, yeah, the, the TCO savings uh, can be substantial. So like another layer of efficiency. All right. Should we talk about, well, all this is great. How do you pay for it? <laughs> How, how, how does this actually work and how does it run? So um, it's, it's, in, it's in two parts and this gets back to Nutanix being a native part of what you're already doing in AWS versus this being something separate. So uh, Nutanix, you can bring your existing on-prem licenses. So a lot, of, uh, the, a lot of Nutanix customers on the call um, understand that you've been buying capacity-based licenses for the better part of two or three years those capacity-based licenses work for Nutanix clusters in AWS. So align it with the number of cores and the amount of storage that you're using from the AWS bare metal instances. And from the Nutanix side, you're good. You're licensed and you're fully supported. On the AWS side, depending on if you already have a, you know, a, a reserved contract or a, um, a commit spend contract, uh, or if you're just doing things on demand ad hoc, uh, the spinning up of those bare metal instances just becomes a part of your already established AWS billing cycle. So there's nothing new that you need to do other than you're going to notice that you're going to be running bare metal instances where you may not have been uh, using bare metal before. Um, they're all 
speaking of those ad hoc options, you do have those ad hoc options with Nutanix. We do have a pay as you go uh, model as well as a uh, cloud commit model. Um, but by and large, we're, we suspect that a lot of customers are going to be just using their existing on-premise licenses, um, you know, kind of curtailing back, back to the use case discussion, um, you know, data center consolidation, right? Maybe you don't need mm -hmm. eight different branch sites anymore, and you can have those run in the AWS regions that those offices used to be. So let's say there was a Nutanix cluster deployed there. You could use those licenses that you had at that remote site and port those licenses into a AWS uh, deployment. Nice, more flexibility, that's good. So I mentioned that uh, that license portability, those same licenses, they can be used in Azure once we go live with Azure later here in, uh, in calendar year 2021. It'll be able to be ported, ported into Google once Google goes live, you know, in the future. And those same licenses are what you use on-prem. So the ability to have uh, to have a pool of licenses for, you know, your global Nutanix spend, and you can plug and play where those licenses are used, uh, whether that's in, you know, in a Virginia region for AWS or a Washington region or an Iowa region, you can shift and move those licenses where you need it as you need it. Um, and so it's that uh, uh, that mobility that we think is uh, uh, is going going to help create consistency with uh, with uh, customers of Nutanix. So last thing, and uh, here we'll uh, we'll spin into what it looks like to spin up your first cluster. But a um, couple options if you want to try this out yourself. Um, first option is a test drive, and that's what I'll walk through briefly here um, once I uh, finish talking about uh, the, the ways to experience this. So there's a, a two-hour test drive that you can do um, at Nutanix.com, gives you your own instance of Nutanix running in AWS for you to fully experience Prism if you've never touched Prism before. Um, for the Nutanix customers listening to this, um, spoiler alert, it's not gonna look a lot different than Nutanix cluster that you've been running on-prem. <laughs> it's the exact same prism. The only thing that you're gonna notice is different is in the lower left-hand page of your of the home dashboard on prism, it's gonna say AWS bare metal and the bare metal instance type. Um, otherwise, everything else, the look and feel of the prism GUI is gonna is mirrors what you've already been doing for uh, for the years you've been a Nutanix customer. Uh, I don't know about our, our, our audience, but like some of you, if you haven't, checked out test drive i really highly recommend it. it is it is really cool it is really easy it's like it's not like oh here's a platform here's some resources now go at it it actually is, it guides you it walks you through it's teaching you it's go here go there it's very useful so i uh, highly recommend it and it's a yeah. cost and it's like you said bam it's available to you right there you don't have to wait six hours and then come back it is there for you Yep, it's a great education and enablement tool. Um, and yeah, thanks for the commercial, Jen. There, there's more than just clusters that you can use there. There's uh, other products and features on Nutanix that we didn't get into today because it wasn't the, uh, the, the heart of the, the conversation, but you can try out other Nutanix features and products that you may not be used to as a Nutanix customer um, that you can use in a isolated test drive instance for you to get your, your feet wet and uh, get used to it before you know investing in a full-fledged trial or POC, which is on the right hand uh, portion of this slide. So um, every Nutanix customer or even a Nutanix prospect has a, a 30 day free Nutanix software trial that they can use in AWS. Um, and so if we you know, step back a couple slides, right, we're talking about Nutanix clusters, there's a Nutanix software component and an AWS EC2 component. So we are offering up our software for free for you to try uh, in uh, in AWS, the AWS costs. You know, check with uh, um, check to see if you have any free credits available based on how long you've already ha had a AWS contract. Get a hold of your AWS representative, see if they're willing to you know credit your account. Um, but again, with the, this being a 30-day trial uh, and the relative low cost of you know the, the le relatively low cost of a daily spend in uh, in bare metal. Um, you know, a, a, a trial shouldn't uh, shouldn't rack up more than than $100. Um, so again, this is a full Nutanix cluster running at AWS. So you have the full 
portfolio of Nutanix at your disposal to try out uh, in this uh, in this capacity. So um, again, two options: test drive, you know, two to four hours in your own environment, or a actual trial where you have 30 days um, to create a cluster in the public cloud and do whatever you want with it. I'm flashing up some additional resources and links that uh, just further support some of the things that we talked about, as well as um, um, a, a further deep dive on um, what bare metal instances are supported, um, what, the, what that pay-as-you-go pricing looks like from the Nutanix standpoint, as well as a, a great playlist that uh, the Nutanix University, uh, we have a YouTube presence of uh, some uh, bite-sized videos. In fact, it's called a bite-sized series, B-Y-T-E. Uh -huh, type joke, um, where you can get a quick down and dirty look at how to do different things with Nutanix clusters. Um, that uh, that link is there. So let's uh, let's hop into demo time. Demo time. So again, our Q and A is open. So if you have any questions, feel free to just send a question in in the Q and A portion. Yes. So the Nutanix clusters portal, this is what that portal looks like when you're creating your first cluster. Um, this assumes you've already logged in or mapped a AWS IaaS account, um, and that account has the uh, appropriate IAM and, uh, and cloud formation access. Again, the, uh, the links provided discuss what, uh, what permissions are, are required to get this, uh, get this going. So give it a name and a URL for, uh, for you to access it within the portal. Pick your cloud. Again, right now, AWS is the only, uh, only cloud that is GA'd. Pick your cloud account. If, uh, if you have mapped multiple AWS accounts to your Nutanix portal account, you can pick and choose which ones you want. Um, and then the different regions. So only one region is, is shown here, just based on the permissions of the AWS account that we have uh, assigned to this demo environment. But um, it's not just Northern Virginia. <laughs> I won't. I won't even you know start to rattle off all the regions that were supported. But again, the the documentation mentions all the regions, all the bare metal instances supported in each region. Um, and that varies based on uh, on the different geos. Um, and again, that's an AWS thing, not a not a Nutanix thing. So once you pick your cloud in your region, we're going to pull in the existing VPCs that we already detect in that region. And so you can um, pick and choose ones that you've already uh, created or uh, created especially for uh, this Nutanix clusters deployment. Uh, once you hit next, we get onto the different host types that are uh, different host types for the cluster, how many hosts you want in the cluster, the replication factor that you want to apply, so again, um, Nutanix doesn't use RAID, we use replication factors. So either two copies or three copies of your data are um, protected within the cluster at any given time. So let's uh, let's drop down the bare metal, uh, the host type, and, and just give a quick view of what bare metal uh, instances we support. So as of right now, we support four different kinds of, uh, of bare metal types, and they range from storage heavy to compute heavy with some general purpose mixed in there as well. So um, the number of cores you see here is the number of hyper-threaded cores. So the actual number of physical cores is uh, is divided by two uh, for uh, calculating how many Nutanix CVL licenses that you need. Uh, so just want to call that out. And then again, choose your number of hosts. Um, Nutanix customers understand that uh, you can do one, two, uh, one node cluster, two node cluster, or three or greater to actually get a full cluster. Um, you can do all those things except for a two node cluster. Uh, you can do a one node cluster in AWS. You can do a three node or greater up to 16 nodes in a single cluster, uh, but we're not allowing the use case of two because um, two requires a witness and that witness needs to be running somewhere else. And it just, it, we, we don't see a two node in AWS being a, uh, being a, a common thing. So. What is nice is the you you are allowed to create a one node cluster to do some um, testing before you commit right. to uh, uh, further EC2 costs by bumping this up to three, four, five, six, sixteen, et cetera. So Derek, real quickly, um, we talk about this with a lot of our customers when we're doing a regular Nutanix cluster on-prem. You know, 
you have rack awareness and block awareness and all this stuff. But what's nice about new tenants clusters, you may want to elaborate on that, is when you do, it actually puts those nodes in partitions, which are like a separate rack. So it's already doing that high availability resiliency within the cluster. It does that for you. Yes. And um, yeah, we did. We have, this is the first time talking about that. You're right. So um, the same kind of self healing that you've come to expect from Nutanix cluster for the Nutanix customers out there, um, that same self healing is brought to you in, uh, in the public cloud. So uh, as we uh, deploy bare metal instances, we're aware of the, uh, of a construct AWS uses of a partition. Um, and that uh, bare metal partition is something that is isolated from other bare metal instances in their uh, in their data centers. So we purposely deploy these nodes across different partitions mm -hmm. as to you know give you another layer of uh, resiliency uh, in AWS's shared responsibility model. Right, they're responsible for keeping the infrastructure highly available, and so you know they're they're doing their part and. Um, by creating partitions, they allow you, the customer, to try to make sure you're outside of, uh, you're making yourself as highly available as possible. So, um, yes, Nutanix, bare metal, we deploy across partitions, so that way we try to maintain um, as uh, highly up, uh, highly available as a, a good of uptime as you can within a public cloud. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to say that's going to be running, you know, 100%, right? There's a reason that the public clouds don't uh, don't guarantee five nines. Um, if you want a highly available Nutanix cluster in AWS, um, you'd also be creating another cluster in another availability zone or in another region and doing cluster to cluster replication to ensure that uh, your AWS footprint stays uh, stays online. Uh, so now that, you know, once we've picked our host type, the number of hosts we want, the replication factor, your uh, Amazon SSH key to, uh, to uh, access uh, those instances if needed, uh, pick your software. So is this going to be an AOS cluster or a uh, files dedicated cluster? You can do files dedicated clusters in AWS. Uh, pick your AOS version to start out with. And then um, do you, and this gets back to some of the defaults that we do with security groups is, do you want it to be default disabled to access Prism Element uh, from the internet if there is a, a public gateway, a part of your VPC, um, as well as the management service? So CVMs, do you want that to be available? Nah, disable that. Yeah, leave that off, please. <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't want uh, any of that going public. Um, and then this advanced setting, right? The uh, being able to schedule a cluster termination so that way it will automatically uh, decommission itself after a certain amount of time uh, that is available here at cluster create. Um, and so once you hit next, you get the summary page of everything that uh, that you've decided to do. And once you hit create again um, for a uh, for a three node cluster, uh, even you know anything beyond that, uh, in under an hour, you're gonna uh, see the uh, cluster be online and ready for first Prism login uh, for your cluster configuration. So really, if you if you look at this, I mean, for people who have you know built up Nutanix clusters, it looks very similar to Foundation, just a little bit upgraded for talking to uh, AWS. Exactly. Okay, so that's it. So that's uh. The, that's our webinar for today, and we appreciate everybody uh, coming in and joining us. And um, here's additional resources that we have up here. This is recorded, so you will get a follow-up email of this recording, and you can reach out to us for any questions. So again, thanks everybody for uh, participating in today's webinar. Have a yes, great day. Yes.